The lodge was situated in a quiet corner of Transylvania and nestled deep inside the foothills of the Carpathian mountain range, which in turn was surrounded by virgin forest and occasional sheep pastures that clung tenaciously to the steep rocky terrain that formed a visually stunning landscape known to the local Hungarians as the Red Valley. I assumed its title was derived from the tips of the mountain which gave a particular luminescent red hue in the evening setting sun. Below on the valley floor, a river snaked through stone outcrops, fields and small farms. Still, regardless, it was a picture-perfect choice to write and research my new novel, which my London agent waited impatiently to read and had given me a six-month sabbatical from writing TV scripts to complete. Having lived in a city landscape of concrete and steel towers that never slept, the countryside here was peaceful and quiet, save for the occasional howls of wolves marauding in packs, or the passing of an occasional bear with cubs. Yes, it was an idyll that I had long sought after, but until now had never experienced. The building was a single-story wooden and stone affair perched at the front on stilts, like the huddling trees, it seemed clutched at the sides of the hill to brace itself against whatever nature could throw at it. It had a well-stocked wood cellar hewn from the rock, whilst the house was made of timber with large lounge windows that looked grandly down into the valley floor below. At the back, it had a well-equipped kitchen with an adjacent toilet that was powered and flushed by a mountain stream which had cunningly been partially diverted into a stone culvert, which in turn reconnected to the main watercourse as it disappeared into the bowels of the valley floor. A water heater was provided from a solar power source to a crude but practical shower and wash basin. As an aside, I was always curious about where it emerged, but fortunately for my health and modesty, no sign of my labours ever disgraced itself upon anyone's displeasure. The adjacent bedroom also doubled as my office, typing on a small laptop table while perched on the edge of a large old-fashioned wooden bed whose old and faded flower-painted headboard towered up in the wooden beam room. Fortunately, the solar panels provided enough light and power to see me through the summer and autumn. All seemed perfect, but that later became a temporary distraction as its secrets gently unfolded. The agent who afforded this property to me was a Hungarian count who lived some 25 kilometers distant. The house was built in the 1900s for his grandfather, who variously used the property as a shooting lodge or as a place to escape from the political turmoil that encapsulated the region after the Treaty of Trianon in 1920, and which followed the end of World War I when the area was cut away from its Hungarian roots and handed unceremoniously into the ownership of the neighbouring country of Romania. I was told the treaty created a sad disaffection for the locals whose ancestors had lived there for 400 years. However, today old animosities have since passed with the Romanians and Hungarians sharing this vast wilderness together. I first met the Count last year when I stayed at a guest house on his estate. He was a very affable and charming man who was intensely proud of his Hungarian ancestry and had returned to Transylvania following the fall of the Ceausescu regime in 1989, where he and his late father were able to reclaim his country estates which had been ravaged in the past by theft and communism. The guest house was in the former stables of his country house, which he spent years restoring to its former glory. Over dinner one evening, he discovered I was a writer, and so he invited me later into his 19th century Gothic lounge, where we sat next to a beautiful Rococo fireplace, which flickered with light from a roaring log fire blazing in its heart. While sat in tall winged chairs, cradling brandies, we chatted about the region's history, especially its legends and folklore. Of course, and rather predictably perhaps, the subject of Count Dracula cropped up as a joke. While smiling, he poured me another drink. 
He asked in a well-spoken Hungarian dialect, Do you believe in what people would describe today as the paranormal? I was momentarily set back by his question and pondered for a moment. I replied, Well, living in a country with a history eclipsed many times by your own, I would have to say I really don't know. I mean to say that while I have never gotten to see a spook, I cannot say that such a possibility does not exist. His smile broadened as he swirled the amber glow of the brandy in his glass and replied, Here on this estate, workers have reported seeing strange things which may or may not be preternatural. But never nothing you or I would call ghostly. And so, like you, I remain open-minded. However, I own a mountain lodge surrounded by a strange mystery that befell my late grandfather. In fact, he and my grandmother disappeared from there one night in 1923 and were never seen again. And I mean never again. No trace of them was ever found. Oddly, perhaps, the area is noted for strange disappearances. It is claimed that local peasants foraging for wood in the forests and even shepherds have disappeared. Despite searches organised by the authorities, no trace of them has ever been found. He sipped the glass and continued. I have stayed there many times. I have to say nothing untoward has ever occurred. It is a quiet mountain retreat, only accessible in the warmer months by car, as the long winding access road is otherwise an impenetrable mud track through a forest. He paused, licking his lips, and leaning gently forward, he continued. Have you ever contemplated such a retreat for peace and quiet while writing? And when I say peace and quiet, you could only hear the forest and the wind. Of course, he piqued my interest as I wanted to find such a retreat to write my long contemplated novel. Putting these stories aside, I agreed I would soon want to take an official break from my usual task of writing melodramas for the TV networks. And on an agreed price and a shake of the hand, the deal was done. Back in London, my agent was initially furious at the prospect of such a vacation, as TV work was far more lucrative. However, he agreed that the two series I was writing were due to end in the spring, so after some gentle persuasion, he reluctantly agreed. Having conveyed the news to the Count, I arrived in late May. However, the drive to the house was still muddy and slippery after a recent rainfall. With the assistance of a local employee named Bogdan, who I believe was a local shepherd, he met me at the house, and he offloaded my luggage after handing over the keys. My knowledge of Hungarian was limited, so communication was more by gesture than words. Having put the luggage in the bedroom, he quickly showed me the rest of the house and left, only smiling once as I tipped him for his troubles. The Count ensured that the freezer was well stocked and the cupboards were well provisioned with dry and tinned food, which would be enough for my five month stay. The Count also left a note that Bogdan would deliver milk every few days and that his wife would take in any sheets or clothing to be washed, ironed or mended. He also added that a doctor in the neighbouring village would assist with any telephone calls or internet access as the house lacked any signal. I felt very pleased and satisfied with the arrangements for my stay that day. And other than the occasional visit of Bogdan and his wife, the first two weeks were quiet and relatively uneventful. It was a real plus, allowing me time to think and write. But with older properties such as this, there were, shall we say, some minor distractions such as a brown bear rummaging through my garbage and, of course, creaking noises, especially on windy days as the house took the full brunt of a sudden gust of wind which precedes rainstorms in these parts. But other than that, there is nothing really to write home about. But there was something inexplicable about the place, 
It started to get my attention one warm evening as I sat on the porch admiring the setting sunset. I was sure I heard an old violin recital being played on what best I can describe as a scratchy old 78 record playing on a wind-up gramophone. The rough sound of dust and dirt which struggled to be heard was much louder than the violin. At first, I presumed the sound to be from a neighbouring shepherd hut, typical to these remote parts. Still, I knew there were none in the immediate vicinity, and this concert, or call it what you will, lasted for a few minutes before the quiet and uninterrupted sound of nature returned. As darkness fell, I retired to bed and thought no more about it. The following few days and nights were quiet from interruption, although the scratchy violin lingered quietly in my thoughts. I knew deep down that I must have imagined it, as solitude can often play games with the mind. About a month in, I was still busy writing from my impromptu office in the bedroom, when, on a warm sunny day, the light flickered in from below the tree line, in tune with the gentle sway of a breeze rifling through the trees. But for a brief moment, I was sure that the silhouette of a tall woman flipped past from the corner of my eye across the doorway, from the bedroom to the front lounge. It was all so much in an instant, and I naturally assumed that the swaying trees had played tricks with my imagination. But if this was true, I pondered, it would happen again. But it didn't. That, I thought, was puzzling, but I also realised it could be my mind again playing tricks. Regardless, it did give me a jolt to my senses. Later that evening, as the sun lowered its fiery mantle across the mountain tops, I was again on the porch reading my word processor notes from my laptop, when again I heard on a gentle breeze more music from what sounded to be an old record. This time it was a choral concert with voices singing a repeated line that I could not comprehend. And so it continued for a few minutes before the open porch door suddenly slammed shut and the music stopped. A jolt to my senses caused the laptop to fall, but fortunately it wasn't damaged. I assumed the door slamming was caused by a breeze, but what? It was a very still evening. I thought the locals were playing games, but why would they? It was almost dark, and I never saw any lights that would indicate human activity in the failing light. So, I decided to visit the local doctor recommended by the Count to seek advice. After all, if this was human intervention by pranksters, he would surely know who was responsible. After an unsatisfactory night's sleep, I set foot the following day to the nearby village of Mandar Joss, where I hoped to meet the doctor, a man named Kathleen Kutzter. After an arduous journey up and across a hill which led to a track merging with a woodland path, I eventually arrived at the village, which was little more than a few single-storey whitewashed houses, a school, a shop and a minor surgery, which were all strung out together like a row of broken teeth and standing across from the edge of a narrow road, which in turn stood precariously on a steep-sided hill which looked down into the valley below. Dr. Kostera was a warm and affable fellow of a dark Hungarian appearance and aged around 60 years. He had a full head of grey hair with a striking shock of dark hair. He had a short goatee beard and small round rimmed glasses, which reminded me more of a school teacher I knew from my old school. Still, his Hungarian accent shattered that illusion as he welcomed me into his home, which had an attached surgery and office. Despite his thick accent, his English was perfect. Having invited me into his office, we sat down to enjoy a coffee served by his wife, Ilana. The Count, he intoned, informed me that you are a writer looking for some solitude, and the remoteness of the lodge must be perfect for your endeavours. Are you writing fiction, or perhaps a reference work? He quizzically inquired. I told him I hoped to complete a thriller, which I anticipated would be published on my return to civilization at the end of October. Naturally, I told him about my usual work writing TV scripts, and shared my day-to-day -day life in the city, 
As he listened, he took a small but frequent sips of coffee and looked genuinely fascinated. Ultimately, I turned to him and said, What brings an educated man such as yourself to such a remote village in the middle of nowhere? His face lit up a big smile as he put down his coffee cup and slid backwards into his oversized comfy office swivel chair and became rather animated with his hands as he spoke. Uh, you would never believe this, but I was formerly a senior house surgeon at one of Bucharest's largest private hospitals. I wanted to escape the rat race and took this position when it became vacant a few years ago, and I anticipated you would ask, why here? But the explanation is simple. I was born and raised in a district until I was 16, when my family moved to the big city, needing work and better pay. You see, these areas only provide little employment and no other opportunities other than hill farming, and the income is so little that many who are left live in somewhat reduced circumstances. Sadly, he continued in a slightly solemn voice, many others have moved away because of it, and few actually return. I can afford to live here, as my practice is subsidized by my pension, because there are so few patients left. He continued, Anyway, how can I help you? Do you wish to make a call or use my internet, or do you need local advice? I explained to him the odd happenings at the lodge. I wondered whether the locals, as few as they would be, would be playing jokes on me as a visiting foreigner. He closed his hands together in a prayer-like class, and tapping his fingers, a look of anxiety spread on his face. He leaned forward. The Count told you about the disappearances, I believe. Yes, he did, but how are these stories relevant to my situation? Well, it is not the content of what you have experienced, but the legend itself. The locals love to venture anywhere near the place, especially at dusk. Sure, the musical sounds are odd, but I have read of non-radio appliances being able to pick up radio frequencies, and maybe that is what you heard. I dismiss that as unlikely as nothing was switched on, except for a small laptop that wasn't playing any music. But the other odd instances could be coincidental, or perhaps, again, a hyperactive imagination. As a native, I pressed him concerning the Count's grandparents' disappearance and others. He replied rather smugly, I studied the disappearances through the newspaper archives whilst as a medical student, and they were last seen together entering the lodge during a late afternoon in September 1923 by a local hunter, but were found to be missing the following day when a servant called to collect and return them back to their estate. The lodge was completely empty and undisturbed, even their belonging to remain as they left them, and no food appeared to have been consumed on the premises. And despite a police bloodhound search of the area and other locally raised search parties, no trace of them was ever seen again. It was a great mystery. In recent years, researchers using drones checked inaccessible parts of the mountain face to see whether their remains were somehow lodged there, but nothing was found. He then spoke briefly regarding other alleged disappearances, and although he had heard such tales, he could not elaborate further. Anyway, I thanked him for his company and left. Shortly afterwards, I returned home after briefly visiting the only shop in the village to pick up a bottle of Romanian brandy to enjoy that evening following the completion of half of my intended manuscript. It was now mid-July in the Carpathians. Despite the brief appearance of Bogdan and his wife and the occasional trips into the village to see Kathleen make calls and send emails, I remained very much on my own and devoid of human company. But the odd, inexplicable events were still happening. For example, sometimes while in the bathroom, I heard shuffling outside the door. Nothing loud, but the barest sound of someone moving around in the corridor. Of course, on opening the door, the sound ceased, but sometimes I thought I saw moving shadows too. 
I dismiss this as a tiny animal that may have entered the house. Still, no doors or windows remained open, and the coincidences as such were starting to rack my brain. And despite these odd events, I continued with my book and progressing gradually towards completion. One late afternoon, whilst proofreading in the lounge, I heard pretty clearly from outside a woman's voice. <laughs> Obviously, not understanding Hungarian or Romanian, I ventured outside to see whether I had an uninvited visitor calling. Of course, the voice had stopped when I opened the door, but walking away into the forest from the woodland path at the rear of the house was a middle-aged woman wearing a white and red striped dress with a red bodice and a headscarf. Her hair was black and tied back, and her complexion was swarthy. She appeared to be carrying yellow chanterelle mushrooms in a reed-woven basket. I had, of course, never seen anyone dressed like this. I recalled Catalin's words on the poorer lifestyle endured in these parts, and I assumed it was someone merely wearing a hand-me-down, and there my thoughts on the subject ended. I caught her, but she ignored, or perhaps she didn't hear me. I chased after her to see whether she would sell me some of these woodland gathered mushrooms, which I have to say I've only ever eaten in the swankiest of restaurants. But the closer I got to her, the further she seemed ahead of me. Eventually, after following a difficult winding path up a hill, I saw her standing in the forest by an old ruined stone house, hidden darkly by trees and she smiled briefly at me and walked inside the ruin, obscured by the stone remnants. I arrived no more than a minute later by scurrying off the primary trackway and into the forest. But when I got there, she had gone. Moss and lichen were still covering the ground, but nothing remained disturbed. That indeed was strange, but the fact that this small stone ruin stood in this hillside forest seemed just as odd. After a breach search of the area, I returned to the lodge. I reasoned that she couldn't have been a ghost, as she looked perfectly natural, and of course, it was still daylight. Ghosts indeed, I feel as she thought, would only haunt at night. But regardless, I was deeply shaken by such an odd encounter. I decided to drive immediately over to visit Kathleen, hoping he could shed some light on this rather strange event. I had no intentions after this experience, of walking there through the forest alone. Apparently, I looked shaken by the experience as he looked at me with some concern and said, You look as though you've seen a ghost. Having beckoned me to sit in his lounge, his wife poured me a large shot of rum, which I consumed in a shot. I grimaced with a forced smile while I related the recent sighting in the woods to him. He gave a knowledgeable nod and said, Hmm, that's interesting for two reasons. Firstly, that ruin may once have been a forester's home, and by your description of the woman's costume, I would say such clothing hasn't been worn since the early 20th century. I know some people, that is to say some gypsy women, still wear similar dress style to what you describe, but not for picking mushrooms. I would, at a guess, say the clothing sounds as though it originates from the 19th century which would seem ridiculous, no? Could you show me this ruin? I'm not personally aware of any in this area. By arrangements between ourselves, we met at the lodge the following afternoon. It had been raining earlier, and the ground was wet and quite soggy underfoot, while a floodwater rush filled the stream next to the house. On such a day, the sky was overcast, everything seemed to be an ominous grey, and the forest was deathly quiet. Already I felt apprehensive about visiting that ruin again. Kathleen was suitably dressed in alpine hiking gear, and at my invitation he followed me to the site of the old ruin. When we arrived, everything was as I remembered it. Using satellite navigation equipment, he fixed its location and examined the ruins. He also took photographs from different angles and sat with me on the low stone wall to report. Uh, judging by the size and layout of the house, it was definitely a forester's home. Difficult to say how old it was, but as most of the foundations remain, I would speculate that it came from at least the 18th century, he added. 
The woman's appearance certainly adds an interesting conundrum to this mystery, which I will now research. I have a friend who is a history professor in Brashov. I will certainly get back to you again soon. During our time there, we felt we were both being watched by someone hiding in the forest. But no matter how hard we looked in the shadows of the trees, we could not observe anyone. Kathleen remarked that being in these remote places can play havoc with the human senses, and perhaps this was why we felt this way. Ensuring we had completed our survey, we returned safely to the lodge, where we parted company as he drove off in his SUV. I entered the lodge feeling grateful to have had human company, and I unlocked the door and entered the kitchen to drink bottled water from the fridge. And I was shocked to see a fresh pile of chanterelle mushrooms on the table. What the heck? I exclaimed as my heart raced excitedly at the discovery. I was convinced Bogdan or his wife collected them for me, and what delicious meals they made. However, three days had passed uneventfully, and I had yet to hear back from Kathleen. After lunch that day, I was visited again by Bogdan. I thanked him in Hungarian, but he looked at me somewhat confused, as it was clear he didn't understand why, and showing him the last of the mushrooms in the refrigerator only made matters worse. Feeling slightly embarrassed over the encounter, he left me with a milk pal. He hurriedly departed after dismissively shaking his head and saying quite emphatically, No! To be honest, I felt like a complete jerk because he clearly wasn't the source of the mushrooms. But who had access to the lodge? Nothing was untoward and the premises were secure, and as far as I was aware, only I had the keys. The mystery deepened somewhat, and on the outside chance, the Count himself could have possibly had them sent over as they were in season. During the night, I got up to visit the toilet, and at the foot of my bed I saw red and blue balls of light that swung in circles before me. As quickly as I saw them, they vaporized into the darkness as I shone my flashlight directly at them. I went to the loo, but afterwards promptly fell asleep. Upon waking, I assumed again my imagination was at play. This was soon forgotten when I read a handwritten message from Kathleen left by Bogdan's wife the following day to contact Kathleen as the note added that he had something of interest to share. Excitedly, I drove over to his house where Kathleen ushered me into his lounge. At the same time, his wife Ilana prepared a fresh coffee and a slice of homemade cake. Good news, my friend. Please sit while I go get some papers from my office. He returned a short while later with a folder of paper, from which he thumbed through the pages before extracting some typewritten notes, and then I related to him the sudden appearance of the mushrooms in my kitchen, and the very same variety carried by the woman. Kathleen sat quietly, and then rang the Count, who assured me that no deliveries were sanctioned or made. He too was intrigued by the locked door, but he believed it to be a goodwill sentiment from a local, and quite possibly, he added, perhaps the donor had a copy of the key, as the same lock and key had been used for many, many years. He did ask whether I wanted the lock changed, but I declined, as I didn't like the inconvenience of waiting for a locksmith to arrive, and after all, this is a gesture of goodwill. The key owner never meant me any harm. After ending the call, Kathleen picked up his notes, which were forwarded to me by his historical contact in Brashov. Uh, well, uh, where do I begin? Kathleen remarked. Uh, uh, yes, here it is. He paused. Yes, at least 40 disappearances have occurred every 90 to 100 years, and, and sometimes more often. The earliest records date back to 1543 after Sultan Suleiman of the Ottoman Empire took over the region from the Hungarians. Apparently some of his soldiers entered the district and sacked the local church, after which they murdered the local priest. Gold, silver and the chalice and plate used in Christian sacraments were missing, and under torture the priest claimed he had hidden them in a nearby cave. The soldiers searched for this valuable booty, but were never seen again. 
and the cave later disappeared in an earthquake. The villagers believed it was God's retribution destroying the heathen invaders, but to this very day nobody has rediscovered the cave entrance, which could now be covered by rubble and shielded by tree. I sat quietly transfixed by these notes which Catalin read verbatim. Oh, he continued, the cave was a huge complex with many chambers. It is rumored that the early Dacian people used the complex for worshipping the dead and I dare say sacrifice, but that of course is pure conjecture, I think. I interjected, surely such a giant complex cannot simply disappear from history or maps of the period. Well, there are lost villages littered across Romania as a whole. Some recent discoveries were unmapped, and the reason was simply to hide them from their enemies. The Ottomans and the Mongols spring to mind on that notion, and earlier perhaps with the Dacians from their enemies of Rome. Even after World War II, there were some religious sanctuaries which survived hidden from the gaze of the Russians and the communists. He continued, The region still has many secrets hidden from the modern world, and lastly, let's not forget prehistoric cults whose meeting places were only known by a select few. Romania as a country of which we are now part of is truly the last medieval landscape in Europe, and some areas remain forgotten by man because of their rugged terrain. The desire to complete my book seemed less relevant in the light of these discoveries, and the intrigue these events generated was a compulsion and a desire to learn more. And to rediscover this almost mythical lost cave, I of course thanked Catalin and returned to the lodge to consider my next move. That night I found myself sleepwalking through the forest. In the distance I saw a procession of lights threading down the hill and disappearing into nothingness ahead of me. It was a bright moonlit night, and the light from the moon guided me towards this point. I could also see a hole in the rocky ground, which had cut within a series of stone steps leading downwards into a torch-lit corridor. Fearfully, perhaps, I looked for other people, but could not see anyone or any activity. It was strangely deathly quiet, and I quivered with a fearful apprehension. I could not understand why I would have walked in my sleep, which I have never done before, and of course, why am I here? I wanted to return and find my way home, but my curiosity was an even stronger desire to learn more. Could this discovery reveal why so many have disappeared? Summoning enough courage, I ventured further into the corridor, and as I walked down this damp and slippery shaft, I could faintly hear voices which grew more robust and more evident the further I walked. The growing terror I was feeling was untenable, and then passed out. I remember waking up in my bed with a terrible headache. What I thought was a reality was a dreadful dream, so I breathed a huge sigh of relief from this nightmare. One detail that was locked in my memory was the location of where I was in that forest. I remember distinctly seeing a large spruce tree which appeared to have been struck by lightning. It stood resolute as a blackened spear with burnt debris from its branches lying on the ground. I also remembered seeing it once during a stroll in the forest, but where I saw it baffled me. Or it may have more to do with a writer's hyperactive imagination aided by the historical tales shared to me by Catalin. I decided firstly to attempt an aerial search by drone as the forested hill was quite substantial and filled with almost impenetrable trees. Having four 20-minute flight batteries, I carefully scoured the hillside with the drone for nearly an hour without success. By now, the light was failing due to the growing storm cloud slowly heading in my direction. As so often in these districts, it was accompanied by a strong wind causing the drone to issue a flight instability warning. However, I managed to get the drone back safely to the launch pad on the lodge's veranda. Despite going through the recorded footage on the drone's SD video card, I still could not see the tree anywhere. Still, I did correlate precisely where I saw the torchlit procession through the trees. If anywhere was a reference point, that would be it. 
The drone footage showed a winding trail that started above the base of the bare mountain outcrop. For anyone unfamiliar with this terrain, it resembled more of a goat trail. But I digress. Three days elapsed, so I decided to continue with my book. Yet this chain of events always occupied my mind because I thought it would make good copy for any future yarn. As the day was warm and sunny, I decided to sit outside on the veranda in the shade, which I found more invigorating than being stuck inside a stuffy bedroom. About an hour passed when an eccentric-looking elderly gentleman dressed in old-fashioned plus fours and a Norfolk jacket and a trilby hat approached me from the woodland path. He was round-faced, clean-shaven and with a warm, accommodating smile. In an English accent, he doffed his hat and said, Good day, sir. I understand you're from Old Blighty. I was set back to hear an English voice and immediately stood up and put down my laptop to walk over and shake his hand. I'm surprised to meet a fellow countryman in this forlorn place in the middle of nowhere. He chuckled and at my invitation he joined me on the veranda and stared into the abyss of the valley below and said, Jolly nice view here, eh, what? I remarked that it was and he continued, My name is Sir Roger Bryson, but please call me Bry. I am an English resident of this district. In fact, I live in the valley below in that large Swiss-style lodge you can see, which sits just on the bend of the main access road into the valley itself. As he spoke, he leaned forward, pointing to a dwelling that set itself out from other properties by its large size. I asked, how did you know about me stuck way up here, Bright? Oh, words do get around these parts, and I've been planning to get up here for some weeks. Fortunately, today an opportunity presented itself when a local in the valley had some business in your nearby village, so I'm here for at least an hour before returning. He removed his hat and in the heat wiped his bald, reddened head with a handkerchief from his pocket. I offered a cooling drink, but he declined and continued. I rather like being up here. It is still much cooler than the valley and much more quieter. Do you live here for time, Briar? Only until November, when I return back again to Blighty. I've been coming here for years, and it's my only true wilderness. Are you living here permanently? I explained my presence here, and that I was writing a book for release later that year. Playing with the brim of his hat, he remarked, Many years back, I stayed here in the lodge. I was much younger and enjoyed the walks through the hill forests. It was certainly a different time, I can say, and the people were impoverished, but somehow happy despite their disposition. I'm sure you heard about the disappearances here. They seem to be legends. Take the Count and his wife, for instance. He had a very talented violinist as a daughter. After her loss in a horse tram accident in 1920, he would spend long evenings listening to recordings she made as a debut musician playing for a symphony orchestra in Budapest. One was a violin solo, the other a violin introduction for a choral piece. He would sit in here for hours and hours playing the records on an old 78 wind-up gramophone. So often played, it was said that the recordings were worn away until they were barely audible. He was, as you may realise, beside himself with grief, and no doubt that went with him to his grave when he and his wife finally disappeared from the world in 1923. Deeply shocked upon hearing that, it prompted me to ask, Did you experience anything odd when you stayed here? I mean to say, things that happened which defied explanation. He looked at me fearfully and asked, Did you see the woman in the woods? Well, yes, I certainly did. I have seen her twice in the past. I was told that she was brutally murdered nearby. Her body, I was told, had been torn into small pieces. They suspected it was a bear because of its teeth and claw marks. Yet there was no trace of blood. She had been bled dry. It was believed to have happened while she was picking wild mushrooms. 
You could never be too sure in these woods. It is a strange place, I would have to say. But odder still, her body disappeared one night from her freshly dug grave. Again, it looked like the work of an animal. It was never seen again. I shuddered at this horrifying tale and replied, Yes, I saw her and later found chanterelle mushrooms on the kitchen table. He stiffly rose to his feet, thanked me for my time and said, uh, Better get going, old boy. My lift back will be waiting for me. With impatience, I implored him to tell me more. He shuffled his feet a little and looked down at his stocking feet before turning his head to me and saying rather solemnly, She, for me, was the precursor of death. I sadly lost my wife a few weeks later, who fell to her death from a mountain peak, and my brother, who was here on holiday a few years afterwards. He stayed at the lodge and was never seen again. He started to walk away, kicking a stone as he momentarily paused and stopped to turn and face me. Take care, that's all I can say on the subject. This is a beautiful place, but even in paradise, there are dangers. I was surprised and stunned at my meeting with him and somehow suspected that he knew more than he was sharing with me. I saw him pass into the forest and then, as if by magic, he was gone. Despite his words of warning, I was somehow gratified to know that the music I had heard was not my imagination. Rather than end my stay here, I decided to remain because all I experienced and learned would make solid reading in my future anticipated writings. I later shared Bry's information with Catalin. He was deeply fascinated but appeared very surprised and a little concerned. To my knowledge, you are the only Englishman in the district. I am sometimes called to deputise for the doctor who serves the valley folk. If uh, Sir Roger Bryson lived there, I would have known of him. You see, any foreigners in this district are well known to all. But who knows? He may be a recluse, although such a notion is doubtful. By now, I was as confused as Catalin and decided for once to drive down to the valley a prospect I wasn't looking forward to. The roads going down were narrow and often at the edge of the cliffs. Add blind bends and frequent rock falls, it was not something I particularly favoured. But Catalin elected to accompany me, as he too was looking forward to meeting this mysterious, eccentric Englishman. After an hour of driving along the mountain pass roads, we eventually arrived at the valley floor a flat, green and fertile area alongside a small unspoilt river, as is common in these parts. The animal grazing pastures here were unfenced and avoiding the odd untethered cow stepping out onto the road was challenging, but the views from the road into the hills on the mountain range were staggering. After some minutes and passing many small holdings, we eventually came to a house identified by Bree. A large sign identified the building as the Hotel in the Valley. Indeed, I thought, I must have made some mistake, but clearly I recalled where Bree pointed and assumed, not unnaturally, that he was running a summer hotel from here. Having parked inside the gravel-filled parking area, we wandered into the foyer. It was originally a private house built in 1910 by the carved date above the entrance and had many original features preserved inside, and particularly of note was a rather grand staircase and some beautiful Edwardian-era doorways. I commented to Kathleen that the interior reminded me of home, and a young, well-educated, English-speaking female staff member answered, Well, yes, it was. It was a build for a British businessman who had this as a summer residence. I then inquired, is uh, Sir Roger Bryson around today? The staff member, named by her lapel badge as Arena, laughingly replied, You are teasing me, aren't you? Is this your English humour? She continued, He built the house and disappeared in 1933 when he went hiking in the mountains. No trace was seen of him again. Why? Are you related to him? I nudged Kathleen to remain silent, 
withheld the obvious shock I was feeling and said, um, my apologies, I was researching for a book and must have made an error with some historical detail here. Do you have any original photographs from when he was at this property? She replied pretty confidently, Well, yes, we do. During a clear out of the attic, we found some pictures of what it was like then and even images of this man. She escorted us up to a wall next to the reception desk and among the many faded photographs were some showing Sir Roger dressed exactly as I remembered him and around the same age. I asked, was he well known among the landed gentry of the period? That is to say, the Count whose family still remain in the area to this day? She smiled. That I can show you here. She then indicated an image of an elderly man and a woman resplendently dressed in 1920s clothing. Next to them was a slightly younger Sir Roger, and all three looked as though they had just exited an old-fashioned Rolls Royce parked behind them. Isn't it strange that all three disappeared from the mountains ten years apart and in the same month of September? My family, who bought this house from the late estate of Sir Roger, knew them well, and this mysterious disappearance was a talking point for many years. She then allowed me to photograph the image for my research, and after enjoying a free coffee, we left. Kathleen was highly perturbed by these revelations as I was. He suggested that we approach a well-known gypsy lady. He claimed she might be able to add some spiritual clarity if we took her to the lodge. Apparently, she would lived some distance away in the town of Sigisora, which was a couple of hours' drive from the district. According to reports, she could lift curses and give insight into strange acts of the paranormal. I interjected, in England we would call her a medium, and yes, if she was willing to come, I would pay her handsomely. Kathleen agreed, but suggested we speak with the present Count first. After all, it was his property, and he indeed had a right to know. I declined initially, as the Count might object or even go as far as asking me to leave. I thought it best to leave matters until after the gypsy lady had visited. Through Kathleen, the gypsy woman, with whom I shall now refer to as the medium, agreed to attend at a reasonably hefty price and only on the condition we took her from home and back in a day. That in itself was a challenge as roads in this country were arduous due to the terrain, stray animals, people's driving habits and of course the inevitable traffic jams caused by tourists and people riding a horse and cart, which is common in these parts. Anyway, to get to the point, the medium who identified herself as Nana Varga arrived as agreed after an early start and a four-hour drive to the lodge. Kathleen decided to act as a translator, and I will quote what was said in direct English. Varga was a woman in her late fifties. She was dressed in a traditional gypsy costume, consisting of a heavy yellow skirt embroidered in different colours, a blouse and top, and a heavy shawl. Her hair was tightly held back by a band over which she wore a head scarf. Her skin was rough and dark, like old leather, and she stood by the car, viewing the lodge with a very, very deep suspicion. She mumbled something I assume was in a Romany language. Then she crossed herself before striding into the lodge, standing at the open doorway, and turned and said excitedly, This area is a portal to the underworld. Many are trapped and are angry that they cannot move on. She muttered something in Romany and cast some dust from a small pouch across the threshold. Turning to us both, she eyed before pointing at me and said, There is an entity called the Strigoi, which has some evil so powerful that everything in this house and forest is drenched in its strength. She momentarily appeared to falter in her steps, but she held firmly to a chair to gather her posture. She breathed heavily and seemed as though she was about to pass out. She then clasped a crucifix from around her neck, fell to her knees and said a special protected prayer typically officiated by priests of the Orthodox faith. Afterwards, she again crossed herself and said, This place is now clear of all evil, but outside of this building, you will always be in grave danger. 
Trembling fearfully, I asked her, Where is this creature from? Is it a demon? She replied, It was once a human being like you or me, but this creature died in tragic circumstances. This one was a priest, but his brutal death troubled his spirit so badly that he rose from his grave to seek vengeance from the living and will continue to do so until he is destroyed by having his head severed from his body. She paused after breathing heavily. It can assume a different form to these victims, but reverse to its natural state as it appears to finally kill its prey by draining their lifeblood. To destroy it, you must use a sharp weapon like a sword or axe wiped with holy water and a blow so powerful that its head will leave its body completely. Wounds are half cut for heal instantly, and then it will be unstoppable. Its complete destruction will release his soul and that of his victims, who will gather nearby in a few days as a cave, which is his earthbound lair. I believe you were shown such a place in a dream. There is no point in leaving the area, for wherever you travel, it will find you and kill you. You must find and confront it first. How will I recognize this creature? Would it look like a wolf or a bear? She paused briefly, closed her eyes, and kissed the crucifix before saying, The stilly guy are said to be bored on top of the head, and it does not eat garlic and onions and avoids incense. It possesses great strength. Its spine is elongated in the form of a towel and covered with hair. He has long, sharp teeth and is a very cunning creature. As she prepared to leave, she said, There is one final detail. It cannot enter any building or area where the ground is laid with garlic. With that, she left with Kathleen. I was too sick with fear to want to leave the lodge, and I was fully aware through the presence of the woman and Sir Roger Bryson that the creature knew who I was and where I lived. A few hours later, Kathleen returned to the lodge. He had with him a museum relic in the form of an Ottoman sword, which he had borrowed from a friend who was a collector. The sword with its own scabbard had a very sharp blade. Kathleen added, handing it over, I had the local priest give me some holy water, which I suggest you wipe over the blade. I would also suggest I stay with you for a couple of days until at least this matter is over. I can tell you I am as terrified by this as you, and until now I would have believed this was a stuff of nonsense. Still, as a child, my grandmother, who told me stories about this creature, which I assumed was mythical nonsense, and yet here we are. We must find its lair to be certain we can confront and kill it. I was very thankful that he was prepared to risk his life to help me, and made a spare bed for him to sleep on in the lounge. The following day was tensely quiet. Knowing what may happen ate away at my stomach like a gnawing sullen pain. Even outside the lodge, it felt weird in an intangible way that I couldn't quite put my finger on. Kathleen himself mainly remained quiet, and he seemed to be constantly looking in every nook and cranny for someone or something. Later that day, we discussed a tactic to confront this evil, which, if was to be believed by Nana Varga, was less than a day away. I recalled the dream which took me to a point in the forest where the blackened trunk of a spruce tree stood, but like me was still determining where he first saw it. After all, the forested hills covered thousands of hectares of virgin countryside. However, we decided to follow the trail I had discerned from the drone where I had seen the long procession of torches in my dreams. And so, with my sword and scabbard worn around my belt, we set off with enough food, water, flashlights and rope to deal with any contingency. After an hour of laborious climbing up a steep trail, we saw the tree from my dreams in the forest. Its blackened shaft pointed upwards like a spear into the forest canopy. We, of course, split into two, searched around the stump and found a rocky outcrop resembling a badly sculpted pyramid that rose some six or so meters and, despite a meticulous expanded search, revealed no obvious entry. 
But only a few meters away and into a very tightly wooded area, Kathleen shouted he had found a hole blocked by stone. I excitedly joined him and pulled out the debris that showed a crudely cut staircase descending into the gloom below. We turned on our flashlights and carefully entered this man-made entrance, which we assumed was the way into the lost cave. Sure enough, at the bottom, some 10 meters down, was a stone passageway that led another 20 meters into a vast, crudely cut opening. So significant was this void that our lights couldn't penetrate the gloom, and so using the rope as an escape route, we tied one end to a wooden stake, which we hammered into a crack in the rock wall, and after securing the rope to the stake, we very carefully walked into the blackness. Shortly after, we saw an arrangement of stone slabs, each covered with an old cloth shroud. These were laid out into a semicircle and numbered at least 40. On the outer circumference were other slabs which remained bare. Kathleen said, Shall we look to see? I hesitated. What if this creature was waiting for me under a shroud? I carefully removed the sword from its scabbard and wiped the blade on both sides with holy water. Flashing Kathleen to proceed, he poured a shroud, which immediately disintegrated into dust. Lying beneath were the desiccated remains of a human figure, dressed in the uniform of what I perceived as an ancient warrior. To behold such a sight in this dreadful place was horrific. It reminded me of the catacombs of St. Micken's Church in Dublin, where the author Bram Stoker conceived the idea of Dracula. And yet here we were in Transylvania, looking at something so very similar, and it made me recall in horror. We removed instead, or in some cases disintegrated, several shrouds with varying degrees of decomposition. The older they appeared to be, the more decomposed they were. As we moved towards the outer circle, we found that more contemporary remains were better preserved, and that included Sir Roger Bryson, the missing count and his wife. But what of the Strigway creature? In the gloom of our lights, we saw lying on a plinth set back from within the inner circle, a solitary shrouded figure which appeared to be on a higher platform. We both felt that this must be the creature surrounded by his victims. So we carefully crept forward, and with the sword in my hand, we pulled the shroud, which unlike the nearby corpses, was still in solid form. And here was the most tremendous shock. It was the perfectly formed body of Catalin himself. I leapt back, and in absolute shock, I froze to the spot. My brain simply did not know how to react to this discovery. I wondered if this was the creature pretending to be Kathleen, or if it was Kathleen's corpse. I made an immediate judgment call based purely upon my own self-survival. Before the standing Kathleen could react, I immediately lopped his head from his body with one fell blow. The now headless body stood and spurted blood from the aorta artery over the other body on the plinth before it slumped to the floor. The lying platform figure changed immediately from the form of Kathleen into a hunched, bald, grey, malevolent being with a grimacing smile that displayed long, sharp incisors accompanied by the smell of rotting flesh. It snarled, it howled, but fortunately for me, my killing of Kathleen provided a greater thirst for blood. It leapt up on two powerful hind legs and its waving claws were so long they looked like sharpened spears. It then dived in onto Kathleen's corpse, sucking and gorging on his neck stump. Its ugly head was tapered at the back, with a streak of grey matted hair running down its back and onto a long pointed tail that seemingly wagged with excitement. The sight of its pointed ears flapping slightly as it feasted spread a sickening revulsion throughout my body. I knew within minutes how my life was due to end, especially as its other victims' corpses began to stir from beneath their shrouds as they stumbled to their rotten and bony feet. They once again started to draw human form as though in life and staggered towards me, making ghastly shrieks of what one could describe as bestial excitement. I reached into my backpack and pulled out a heavy hand axe with a pre-wiped blade of holy water. 
I had sharpened earlier in case the sword wasn't powerful enough to remove its head. While it feasted on Kathleen, I kicked it hard and it roared with anger and raised its snarling, blood tripping head to strike out at me, but I quickly swung the axe as hard as I could. It cleanly cut through its neck before the creature suddenly burst into flame. The voices of its victims screamed and echoed with joy as many lights rose from their bodies and dissipated into the darkness. The fire consumed the entire cabin, which caused rocks to fall from the roof and in the process I felt the ground shake so violently that I grabbed for dear life the guide rope which led me safely to the entrance. But as I struggled along the final section to reach the surface, the opening collapsed on itself and I was momentarily trapped by loose rock as I felt I was being sucked back into the cavern. I was so near to escape yet cruelly perhaps the beast was having its final revenge, or so I thought. Suddenly a human hand grabbed my arm firmly and pulled me clear into the open. Standing there was a very concerned Catalin. Yes, the very man I thought I had struck dead earlier in the cave. But then, as a final thought, was this actually Kathleen, or was it really the creature? I awaited my fate, not sure whether it would be life or death. The End